But if you'll take to heart what the Bible says and know whatever God says about you, that's who you are. But we need to start speaking blessing so we can receive a blessing. We're called to make sure that people understand that God is alive. God chose his seed very carefully. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Isn't that something to be chosen of God? Hello and welcome to Wherever He Leads. This is our second lesson in uh, the discipleship, becoming a disciple of the Lord. My name is Pastor Tommy Roberts. I'm the pastor of Life Point Christian Faith Center in Tiffin, Iowa. And I'm certainly happy to be back with you again. And we want to get right into today's lesson. Can we do that? But let's have a word of prayer and we'll just see where the Holy Spirit takes us. Amen. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you and give you praise for the abundance of all things. Thank you for your great grace and mercy. Thank you for your love and your kindness that's better than life. Father, we just ask for the next few minutes that you, by your Holy Spirit, would open the word of life to us and let us see things that we didn't see before concerning our own personal walk. And not only that, but also the things concerning your kingdom. We thank you for your great favor that surrounds us as a shield. And for that, we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get right to the word of God. Let's, I'm going to invite you to, today to turn to John 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. We touched on this a little bit last week, and I want to just bring this to your remembrance again so that we can have a clear understanding of what it means to become a disciple. I'm going to be reading this from the expanded Bible. Can I do that? And then I'm just going to bless you. Uh, I believe it'll bless you. I enjoy this expanded Bible so much. John 8, 31 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, very key word, we'll come back to that, believed in him, if you continue to obey my teaching, you are truly my followers. Then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And it goes on to say here, if you continue to obey my teaching, you are truly my disciples. And that's what we want to talk about today, becoming a disciple. Now, notice that Jesus is talking to believers. He's not talking to people that don't believe. So obviously one of the first prerequisites of becoming a disciple. We talked about discipleship last week or last time we were together uh, as it regards somebody who is a follower, a student, not just uh, somebody that follows behind, but actually engages in the same lifestyle and the same precepts and the same beliefs as their teacher. And in this case, the teacher we all know as Jesus Christ. So Jesus is talking to those people that believe. That's what the scripture says. He said it to them that believe. But notice it's not just people that believe that qualify as disciples. Let's read it again. It says here, so Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you continue to obey my teaching. Well, again, we see that first you must be a believer, but that doesn't make you a disciple. Now, I know there's a lot of people maybe that think, well, I'm a Christian and I'm a believer, so I am a disciple. But Jesus himself, the Lord of all, declares that the way to become a true disciple is to obey his teaching. Do you see that? He wants us to obey his teaching so that we don't get off track and start obeying other things or we don't start following other things. So we see here the question then has to be asked, is everyone that is a Christian a disciple? Is everyone that is a believer a disciple or is everyone that says, quote unquote, I'm saved a disciple? Well, by based on the words of Jesus and the teachings and not just this scripture, we'll get into many more. But this is where we're starting at. The answer is an emphatic no. Not everyone that is a Christian, not everyone that is a believer, not everyone that says they're saved is a disciple. There is a difference. And so what we want to look at over the next few moments as we get into this a little bit deeper is what are the differences? How do I become a disciple? Jesus is coming back for his disciples, his loved ones. He's looking to be able to place people in positions of authority to move throughout the earth and, and to govern the eternal kingdom but they must become disciples. So let's look at this just for a moment. So he says, disciples didn't, excuse me. He says, disciples here are those that follow my teaching. Now I wrote this down. Disciples don't decide what they want to do. Rather, they do what the master tells them to do. That's one of the first things that we find in the life of a disciple. Look at the lives of the, of, of the apostles that followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, Paul, James, uh, excuse me, Peter, Paul, and James, uh, Peter, James, and John, forgive me. You know, Paul came a little bit later. But with that, they were obedient to do what he said to do. 
They were obedient to follow his teaching, even to the point where it cost them their life if necessary. That's discipleship. That's true discipleship. So disciples don't decide what they want to do. Rather, they, they do what the master wants them to do. Let's look at this. We need to be trained and developed into true discipleship. Discipleship and situations involving discipling are found hundreds of times in the New Testament. Let me say that again. We first must be trained in true discipleship. We at LifePoint there in Tiffin, Iowa, suburb of Iowa City, Iowa, we strongly emphasize discipleship training. We haven't mastered it yet. We've got a long way to go. But that is what we're after. We're not after just converts. We're not after just people coming, making confession of salvation. That's good. That's necessary. But what we're really after is people who will, who will lay down their lives, their own agendas, and their own desires to follow and pursue the life that Jesus Christ came to give them. Amen? So discipling during this teaching is not dealing with us discipling each other. Let me say that like this, but rather us becoming disciples of the Lord Jesus. It's not enough for me to disciple just somebody that's with me or let somebody become a follower of Tommy or a follower of, of so-and-so. No, what we come to do is position people to become followers of Jesus Christ. He is the master. We are the pupils. We are the students. We follow his lead. And so if what I teach as a pastor or an evangelist or one of the fivefold gifts of the ministry, if, if what I teach does not line up with what Jesus taught, people shouldn't be following me. Because everything I do should lead people to Jesus Christ and a greater understanding of who he is. Hope you can say amen to that. So we're not just out here trying to make uh, spiritual sons and daughters, people to follow us because we have a great message or we've got charisma or we've got all these things going on, great degrees but rather what we're doing is we're emphasizing the message of Jesus Christ. He who would say to us, take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, he that would love his life must first lay it down. He that would become chief in the kingdom must be willing to become less in the kingdom. Those are the teachings of Jesus Christ. Let's look at a passage of scripture, if you would, for me. Turn to Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 29 through 30. I'm going to read this from the King James Version. Acts 20, verses 29 through 30. Now, one of the things I want to stress before I get into this a lot is I want to stress who's teaching here. This is the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, I mentioned him a few minutes ago. Apostle Paul is, is one who comes along on the scene. He finds a relationship and fellowship and intimacy with Jesus Christ after Jesus Christ has already ascended to heaven. So he wasn't one of the original disciples. He wasn't one of the original followers. He, like many people that we find in our world today, were people who were outside of the kingdom, people who were not curious or not even, not even interested in finding out about things of Jesus Christ. He had an appointment with God that took place, as we know, on the Damascus Road, where as he's traveling to carry out orders against Christians, think about that, he's traveling to, to actually commit acts of violence against Christians, what, what happens is Jesus Christ comes to him, introduces himself to him, and he asks him, what are you doing? And Paul, you know, as he was known then, was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Saul, you know, he falls to his face. Things begin to happen. He comes up, I'm summarizing this, he comes up by saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? And from that moment on, he moves forward in becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true follower, a true teacher a true person who lives the life, who walks the, who walks the walk, not just talks the talk. See, a lot of Christians want to just talk the talk. They want a convenient Christianity. I, I know it sounds kind of hard, but I'm trying to get you somewhere. What I want, to, want you to see is that Jesus requires all. He wants all. Now, he doesn't take all and just blow our lives up, so to speak. But what he does is he gives us a new way of thinking, a new way of looking, a new way of living. And that's what he's come. Well, how are we living, Pastor Tommy? We're living like kingdom people. We have become kingdom minded. We have become focused on the eternal realm of, of, of heaven. We have become focused on our faith being utilized to carry out the plan of God in the earth. We have been focused now as disciples to become dominion or authority minded. We can go in and we can stop the work of the enemy. The Bible says that for this cause was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we're supposed to do the same thing. We're supposed to destroy the works of the devil. 
So that's what we come to do. And that's what the Apostle Paul started doing. So Acts 29 says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also your own selves shall men arise, seeking, or excuse me, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Listen to this again. Paul says he's getting ready. He knows that his departure is close at hand. And he's talking to the people that he considers his own followers through Jesus Christ. Now, that's important. Followers of Christ, followers of of Jesus Christ and the teachings of Christ. So what he says here, I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And guess where they're coming from? They're coming from right in your midst, he says. They're not coming from outside. They're coming in from people who want to all of a sudden have a greater platform, have a, great, have a greater message, have a greater position. Wow. Is that really going to happen? Well, it's already been happening. It's been happening since the time he spoke it, and it's been going on since then. He goes on in verse 30 to say, also of your own selves shall men arise. That's what, he did, what I just got done saying from your own group. Men will arise speaking perverse things to take away disciples after them. In other words, what they want to do is they want to pull people after them. They want people to follow their teaching. You ever been around somebody who wants people to follow them? It's not really about Jesus. It's not really about the message or the, or, or the, 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 the cause of what they've been called to do. It's more been about them. I've been around people like that, you know. And I learned real quick early on in life, especially in my Christian life, that the best thing to do is to give them a wide berth and to give them plenty of space. Because everything we do as men and women of God, as men and women of the gospel, should reflect right back to Jesus Christ. My wife and I have a saying in, in, in one of the churches that we pioneered uh, years ago. Uh, we, it says that we should let our lives be the mirror that reflects the image of Christ. That was our motto. Now, we got that from a denominational church that we used to belong, be a part of. Now, I love, the, I love the message there because everything in the life of the disciple should, imi should imitate and reflect Jesus Christ. Everything should look like Jesus. Now, you say, oh, man, you're being real spiritual. You're being real religious. No, 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 no. What I'm saying to you is that what God is looking for is those people who don't care about their own personal agenda. Those people who will at any cost, as long as it's according to the scripture, at any cost, do his will. Sacrifice whatever they have to sacrifice, you know, and that's what he's looking for. So anybody that is looking to pull people to themselves, not for the cause of Christ, is trying to build their own kingdom. And that goes contrary to everything Jesus taught. Let's look on. Let's read. I want to read this from the, from the expanded Bible. I just read it from the King James Version, but... He says, I know that after I leave, some people will come like wild wolves and try to destroy the flock. Verse 30. Also, also, he says, and will lead away f disciples after them. Now, if the if the writing of the gospel is true at all, it's all true. And so with that, if people come and they tell you that this is the way you should, you have to live your life this way, you must follow this teaching, you must follow this dress code, you must follow this, you must follow this. Now, I'm not going to argue denominational thinking. I'm not going to argue that. What I am going to tell you is that Jesus Christ has come for every believer, every Christian, to become not only a believer, but a, a disciple. Now, what he's come to do is to cause you to be led by his Holy Spirit. Can you say that word? It's a good word, two words. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit to lead you into more abundant living, more abundant living, a greater life. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to study, you're going to have to learn these things and grow up in Christ. I know as a pastor, a lot of times, you know, I, I talk to our congregation you know, and tell them that we have to grow up. We must mature in Christ. The Bible says that we have been using milk in one place, in the book of Hebrews, for, for example, that we, if we're using milk, we're unskillful in the word of righteousness. So what does that mean? That means that we have to grow up. And so when people start telling you that you must do this, you must do this, you must do this, you need to, you need to do a double check in your spirit. That's the best way I can say it. Double check in your spirit. 
the old Pentecostals used to say, you know, I had a check in my spirit. You need to double check in your spirit to make sure that you are being led by someone who is following Christ and not just their own agenda, not just their own denominational thinking. And again, I'm not against denominational churches. What I am uh, clearly against is anybody who would try to build their own kingdom and try to make it seem like they're doing the will of God or the, carrying up the cause of Christ. We have, to be, we have to be aware of these things as Christians, all right? So let's go on. So I say here, I've written this down, just because someone helps you to find the master, listen to me well, just because someone comes to help you find the master and to learn to follow the master, that does not make them your master. Wow, let me say that again. Just because someone comes to help you find the master, somebody help me find the master one day. Somebody help me find the master. And to learn to follow the master, that does not make them your master. I want to use a name if I can. I'm going to use a name because this gentleman was very instrumental. He and his wife in my early formation. Uh, I, I was a, uh, uh, and always will be a pastor's son, pastor's kid. My mom and dad uh, were in the ministry all my life. Now, what I want to suggest to you, though, is that I learned as I became an adult and I fell away from the church. One of the things I learned is that um, I needed to get back to the church. I think that was pretty, pretty simple, but I, it was pretty profound for me. I was on my way the, the wrong way very quickly. And so uh, a gentleman, I, I, somebody gave me a tape, a cassette tape. I know I'm dating myself for those under 30, but, you know, a cassette tape was given to me by a gentleman I'd never heard of. Or if I'd heard of him, I didn't know who he was. His name was Kenneth Copeland. Now, when, when I got the tape, I didn't know Brother Copeland. I never met Brother Copeland. But I did listen to the teaching on the tape that Brother Copeland gave. And it was developing a relationship or friendship with God. And I was in my, I was 29 years old. Uh, my wife and I were having hard times in our marriage. I was in the Air Force at the time, you know, stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Pope Air Force Base, you know. But I was there and I'd take that tape and I was so hungry for change in my life that I'd take the tape, I'd put it in the cassette player, I'd drive to work, I'd listen to it, and then I'd put it in the cassette player, I'd drive back home, and I'd listen to it, and that was my routine. I can't tell you how long it was. But I began to listen, and something began to happen. I began to get revelation, I began to change. Now, just because Brother Copeland was the one that God used to get me to the master, he was directing me to Jesus, does not mean Brother Copeland is my master. I think that makes sense. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But there are many people who they feel like you're obligated to them because they led you to the Lord. Or, you know what, you came through first you know what church or second you know what church or whatever. But I'm here to tell you that your obligation, once you become born again, is now greater to the master, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom and his agenda, his will, than anything greater. And so you need to be aware of that so that you don't get led off into the wrong area or what we commonly say in the church into a ditch. So that does not make them your master. Let's keep going. Many people have attempted to make others their disciples. Also, they have tried to manipulate others and keep them functioning as babes in order to exercise a certain amount of control over them. In other words, I, I grew up in a church where you know, we used a particular type of Bible. It was a King James Bible. But, but some of the more learned people uh, had their type of Bible, and they didn't want you to get that Bible because it had a lot of information in it. You know, the Bible I refer to as the Dakes Bible. When I got that Bible for the first time, after I started learning from Brother Copeland, what I began to realize is, wow, this has been available all along and nobody ever told me about it. Now, my dad did. My, my natural father and mother did. They bought me one. They blessed me with, with one and I thought that was great. But many times people will try to withhold information from you so that they can try to maybe keep you as a baby. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not called to remain babies in Christ or babes in Christ. You are called to become mature, fully functioning, fully grown, and that process takes the rest of your life, to be clear. You don't get there one day and, okay, I've arrived. But what happens is, through the course of time, eventually you get to the point where you start eating the meat of the word. The meat of the word. That's what we're after here. So, we all have access to the Holy Spirit, and we can and should begin to grow up and develop spiritually. Under the proper teaching 
of those that are called by God's by God to preach and teach the word of God. In other words, my job as a shepherd, mine and my wife's job as a shepherd, we are called to feed the flock of God, which is our local church, local assembly, the best spiritual food that we can give them. And so that may not be something that we always have in our, for lack of a better term, our, our repertoire. So what do we do? We're shepherds, we're pastors, we walk in that office currently. Okay? There's other offices we do walk in at times, but that's our primary calling. So what do we do if we need somebody to come in and maybe uh, preach a salvation message, something of that, and run a revival? We call on the office of the evangelist. What about if we need somebody to break down a subject or topic matter such as with greater clarity than we're able to do? We call on the office of the teacher. If we need somebody to begin to operate in the prophetic gifts and, and begin to give us a greater insight into, into the word of prophecy and the word of knowledge, we call on the office of the prophet. And oh, by the way, I don't mean to bust your religious bubble or, or step on your religious toes, but I, like I tell our folks at home, you might want to pull them in right now. We also call on the office of the apostle who functions as an overseer and a sent one, a messenger, to bring order and, and, and uh, alignment, proper alignment to the body of Christ. Yes, they still exist. And so with that, we don't fully function in this by ourselves, but we learn. My wife and I go to ministers' conferences so we can feed our spirits, so we can get greater information and insight into things. We listen to CDs, and our phones are filled with teaching messages and preaching messages and, 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 and all types of music. We, this is how we grow, and we're able to continue. We study the Word voraciously. We both have a voracious appetite for studying the Word of God. These are the things that cause success and cause us to mature. Not just my wife and I, not just Lynette and I, but all of us in the body cause us to grow. And so that's what Jesus came to do. So we all have access. And I said this and I'll say it again. The Holy Spirit is the one who constantly reminds me. He'll say to me, Tommy, make sure you study. Make sure you stay close. Make sure you're fellowship. Make sure you're intimate. Make sure all these things that, the, that, that Jesus told, taught you in his word and that I'm coming to tell you and I'm bringing them to your remembrance, do them. Do them, do them. And it makes my life as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple, so much more rewarding. I have, get such joy out of being somebody who is around the things of God, who walks in the favor of God, who can use my faith on purpose to watch God do great and wonderful things. I've learned this by, be, by my training as a disciple. I've got a couple more scriptures here for you I want to read. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle Paul, who we could recognize as a great teacher, many of you would say amen to that without doubt, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 3. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now I say that simply to say this. The Apostle Paul said, If you're going to follow me, Follow me as I follow Christ, as I follow the anointed one. Oh, bless his name. That's so good. And his anointing. There's things about the anointed one and there's things about his anointing that, that are, can sometimes be different and shown differently. We would use the word manifest differently, but show differently. So the Apostle Paul says here, don't just follow me because I sat at the this, this feet of a great teacher. Don't just follow me because I was, uh, had a tremendous pedigree or had a tremendous education. He says, don't follow me for any of those reasons, but follow me as I follow Christ. And in essence, he would be, I could say it this way, if I'm not following Christ, he might say, then don't follow me. So he did everything in his power to ensure that he was following Christ. Last scripture I have for you here is 1 John 2, verses 1 through 3. 1 John 2, verses 1 through 3. I thought this was good. Holy Spirit brought this to my attention. He says, My little children, this is the Apostle John writing, These things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, have, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, big word, for our sins. He is the substitute. He is, the, he is the, 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 the one who's come to pay the price for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wow. The whole world. 
And hereby we do know that we know him. This is where I want to get to. If we keep his commandments. That's the same thing that Jesus started out by saying over there in John. He says this. He says, this is how we know we know him. If we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. That little word if there, conjunctive word, uh, the little word if there means that there's a possibility that you may not keep his commandments. That's not the safest place that I would say for the Christian or for the believer to be. As a believer, as a Christian, you need to always be aware that it's not just you showing up to church on Sundays. It's not just you getting to the point where, you know, you are a good tither or a good giver. It's not just taking communion. It's not just being baptized. Those things are necessary and they're good, but that's not all there is. That's just, to me, I think that's just the opening, just the first step towards getting into the place of becoming a disciple. We've got a long way to go in this. We've got, you know, many more teachings to go in this. I'm just trying to whet your appetite here a little bit. But I want to take an opportunity to do this. Let's say maybe you would say to me, Pastor Tommy, I've not really been, you know, what you're talking about. I've not really been the best disciple. Uh, I've not necessarily been the best follower of Jesus Christ. And, and maybe you feel like maybe you've let him down. Can I first tell you that the Bible says in Romans 8 that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. First of all, you can't let down a God that you're not holding up in the first place. You're not holding God up, so you didn't let him down. But I will say this to you. Maybe you just sense in your heart by the Holy Spirit that things could be better. I want to pray with you right now to get things better. Can we do that? One of my favorite passages of Scripture is 1 John 1 and 9, and it is for believers. It is for people that call themselves saved, for Christians. And it says, 1 John 1 and 9 says, that if any man confess his sin, that he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive him his sin and then to cleanse him from all unrighteousness. And so that righteous one that, Jesus, that John spoke about over there that we just read, that righteous one is Jesus Christ. Why don't you just pray this after me? Dear Father, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of my sin I ask you to place me back in right standing, and I ask you now, Father, Lord, to just cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want to be the true disciple as you've called me to be. I believe by faith that you'll hear my prayer, and I'll receive what you provided for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Wherever You Leave. We want to thank you for joining in with us today. We want to take an opportunity to give you uh, a chance to sow or to bless this ministry, this television ministry. If it blessed you, we certainly appreciate that. One way to give is online at our website, experience the point with an e.com. That's experience the point with an e.com. Or you can mail to us at P.O. Box 337. That's P.O. Box 337, Tiffin, Iowa, 52340. Thank you and God bless you.